Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnson. Welcome to lecture 41 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to introduce a theorem that's helpful for showing that certain matrices are diagonalizable. Now, in the previous video, we, al we already saw a theorem that completely characterizes which matrices are diagonalizable, okay? So we saw that a matrix was diagonalizable if and only if we can construct a set of n linearly independent eigenvectors, okay? And that's still true. Okay, but what this new theorem does is it lets us show that matrices are diagonalizable a lot more easily. Okay, we actually don't have to go as far as computing the eigenvectors a lot of the time. Okay, the drawback is that the theorem that we're going to look at right now, this new one, it's only one way. Okay, it's not if and only if, it just says that, hey, if this thing happens, then the matrix is diagonalizable, but not the converse. Okay, so the previous theorem from the last video is still like the complete general answer. This new theorem is just sort of like a special case that's really, really easy to check, but at the drawback of it only being one direction. All right, so what is the theorem? Well, it says if you've got an n by n matrix and it's got n eigenvalues and those eigenvalues are distinct. So if that happens, then the matrix is diagonalizable. Okay, so if you can find n different eigenvalues of that matrix, it's got to be diagonalizable, okay? So let's go through the proof, see where that comes from, okay? Why is that true? Okay, and we're going to leech off of that theorem from last class, okay? We're going to leech off of it. So in particular, I'm going to rephrase this a little bit, okay? Instead of proving that, hey, if it has n distinct eigenvalues, then it's diagonalizable, I'm going to prove it the other way around. I'm going to prove the contrapositive of that statement. I'm going to show that if A is not diagonalizable, then its eigenvalues are not distinct, okay? And that's a logically equivalent statement, okay? If it's not diagonalizable, then its eigenvalues are not distinct. That's what we're gonna prove, okay? And to prove this, well, I'm gonna start off, I'm just gonna give names to the eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues, okay? So, so corresponding to lambda one is the eigenvector V1, corresponding to lambda two is the eigenvector V2, and so on, okay? So there I'm just giving names to the eigenvectors, okay? And now, well, suppose that the matrix is not diagonalizable. Again, remember my goal is showing that two of the eigenvalues must be the same as each other. Well, if the matrix is not diagonalizable, then via my theorem from last video, I know that this set of n eigenvectors, it must be linearly dependent, right? Because my theorem said that that set of eigenvectors, like there's a set of n linearly independent eigenvectors, if and only if it's diagonalizable. So it's not diagonalizable. This set is not linearly independent it must be linearly dependent, okay? What I'm gonna do is inside that linearly dependent set, there must be a smaller linearly independent set, okay? Like maybe it only has just one vector. Like maybe it's just, hey, V1 is linearly independent. It's a non-zero vector, so certainly V1 itself is a linearly independent set. Maybe I can tack more vectors on there, maybe I can't, I don't know. Just take the largest linearly independent set that you can though. Okay, so let just let K be the size of this set where this is just, is V1 linearly independent? Yes or no? If yes, then check. Is V1, V2 linearly independent? Yes or no? If yes, check. Is V1, V2, V3 linearly independent? And just keep going that procedure until you find the largest linearly independent set that you can and then stop. Stop just before you hit linear, linear dependence. Okay, and then because the set with just one more vector here, because that's linearly dependent, what that means is that VK plus one, like the guy that's just barely not in this set, it must be a linear combination of these guys here. Okay, none of these guys are linear combinations of each other because that set's linearly independent. But as soon as we add one more vector on, it is linearly dependent. Okay, so that, that new guy that was added on must have been a linear combination of those guys that were already in there, of the first k vectors. All right, now I'm just going to call that equation one because I'm going to ref be referring to it in a second. Okay, so that's equation one. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that equation, I'm going to take equation one, and I'm going to multiply on the left by the matrix A. So I'm multiplying both sides of this equation, but, you know, the A is going on the left of both sides of that equation. Okay, and now remember the, each of these vectors, they're eigenvectors of A. Okay, so what's going to happen when I do this? A times VK plus 1, well, that's going to be the same as lambda K plus 1 times VK plus 1. Okay, and similarly for all the other ones, A times V1, well, that's just lambda times lambda 1 times V1. A times V2, that's lambda 2 times V2, and so on, right? Because each of these, they're eigenvectors, so multiplying by A is the same as multiplying by the corresponding eigenvalue. All right. I'm going to call that new equation, equation two. 
All right, I'm also gonna construct one more equation and then throw all of this together. Okay, if I take equation one, and instead of multiplying on the left by a, if instead I multiply by lambda k plus one, then what happens? Well, the left-hand side is gonna be the exact same. I'm just taking vk plus one and multiplying it by lambda k plus one. The right-hand side is gonna be different though. On the right-hand side, I'm gonna get c1 v1 times lambda k plus one, plus c2 v2 times lambda k plus one, all the way up to plus ck vk times lambda k plus one. All right, I'm gonna call that equation three. And now finally, what am I gonna do is I'm gonna subtract these last two equations. I'm gonna subtract this equation three from equation two, and what do I get when I do that? Okay, well, on the left-hand side, I get lambda k plus one times vk plus one minus lambda k plus one times vk plus one. Those are gonna cancel, I just get zero on the left-hand side. The right-hand side is more interesting though. Okay, I get c1 v1 times this eigenvalue minus c1 v1 times this eigenvalue lambda one. Okay, so when I subtract those, I get c1 v1 and then the difference of those eigenvalues. Okay, similarly with the c2 v2 term, the c2 v2, c2 v2, all that differs is the lambda term. Okay, so I get c2 v2 and then the difference of the lambda terms. Okay, and that happens in every single term in these sums. Okay, so it's all the, all the way up to ck vk. And now you stare really hard at this and you remember, but wait, okay, this set of vectors v1, v2 up to vk, that's linearly independent. Okay, so the only way that this equation here can be true is if all of the coefficients in front of the v's are zero. Okay, so c1 times this difference of eigenvalues has to be zero. c2 times this difference of eigenvalues has to be zero. All the way up to ck times that difference of eigenvalues has to be zero. Okay, but furthermore, we know that it cannot be the case that each of the c's equals zero. There has to be at least one non-zero c. Okay, and the reason for that is if you go back to equation one here, we know that vk plus one is this linear combination of the v's. Okay, and because vk plus one is an eigenvector, it's non-zero. Eigenvectors by definition are non-zero. So this is non-zero, so the right-hand side must be non-zero as well. So at least one of the c's must be non-zero. Okay, and whichever of those c's is non-zero, let's suppose that c1 was non-zero, well, that would mean that lambda one minus k plus one. Sorry, lambda one minus lambda k plus one would have to be zero, right? Because we know this whole scalar here has to equal zero. If C1 isn't, then this guy must be. Or maybe C2 is the non-zero guy. Well, then this difference would have to be zero. Okay, all that matters is that there's a, at least one term in the sum down at the bottom here where like lambda two minus lambda k plus one equals zero or lambda three minus lambda k plus one equals zero or whichever one of them it is, it doesn't matter which one of them it is, it happens at least once, we get a collision of eigenvalues, that's the point. Okay, and that's exactly what we wanted to show. We wanted to show that the eigenvalues of that matrix were not distinct, okay, because it's not diagonalizable. Okay, so then we're done. We've shown that if a matrix is not diagonalizable, then its eigenvalues are not distinct, or equivalently, if its eigenvalues are distinct, it must be diagonalizable. All right, so let's go through an example here. Let's show that this matrix A1110, uh, let's show that that matrix is diagonalizable. We're not gonna find a diagonalization of it, but we'll show that it is diagonalizable at least. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, you gotta compute the eigenvalues. Okay, so set determinants of A minus lambda I equal to zero, and there's that matrix A minus lambda I. I compute that determinant using my explicit formula for two by two matrices, so one minus lambda times minus lambda minus the backward diagonal, so minus one. I expand that out, I get lambda squared minus lambda minus one, okay? And I can't factor this polynomial, right? Um, but I can use the quadratic formula on it to find its roots at least. I'll find out when lambda, you know, when lambda squared minus lambda minus one equals zero, that's a quadratic equation. Use the quadratic formula. You're gonna find that, oh, lambda's got equal one plus or minus root five all divided by two, just by plugging into the quadratic formula here, okay? And now we just look at those eigenvalues. Yeah, there are two of them. Great, it's a two by two matrix. I've got two eigenvalues and those two eigenvalues, they're distinct. They're different from each other, right? So yeah, we know right away that matrix is diagonalizable, okay? One thing that th this doesn't tell us though is how to diagonalize it, okay? If we actually wanna diagonalize that matrix, then we do have to go one step farther and find the eigenvectors corresponding to those eigenvalues. 
All right, so that'll do it for today. Next class, we're going to look at a particular application of diagonalization that's really neat. We're going to look at Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so I'll see you then.